for joining us tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Sue Garwood and I'm the director here. And it's a real pleasure to have you join us tonight. As I always do, for those of you who've been to these programs, we've got a little house cleaning, house cleaning to do first. Um, the first is that uh, thank you all uh, who are members. Your membership is what makes programs like this possible. It helps make uh, uh, both in terms of the equipment as well as um, bringing all the PR and all that sort of thing to happen. So that's really wonderful. Those of you who aren't members, we invite you to consider joining. Um, for a small fee, you, I mean, we have the newsletter four times a year. You get access to and knowing when these programs are coming up, as well as reduced uh, fees for other events and that sort of thing, as well as then again, helping to preserve Rice County history and, and all the things that we do. All right, if you would please join me in welcoming Tim Madigan. Oh. If you don't mind, I think it'll be easier to see the uh, uh, slides, but uh, thank you for coming as well, and thank you to the Rice County Historical Society and Susan for sponsoring the uh, presentation. Uh, this is a presentation that's evolved over the years, uh, and I've used it as a foundation for teaching a uh, class uh, at the uh, Cannon Valley Elder Collegian as well. Uh, but, uh, so I'm going to talk about the myths and realities of the 1960s and uh, it's just a way to kind of focus in on different topics. Uh, hopefully they stimulate uh, dis some discussion at the end of the uh, uh, slideshow and uh, there's kind of no right or wrong, there's just different ways of looking at things and that's kind of my purpose is to give a, uh, a different view on it. I, I found the uh, um, This photo uh, last night of Jimi Hendrix, uh, and he's really not in the show, but I finally did figure out a way to mention him later on because it was just <laughs> such a, a neat, uh, iconic uh, photograph, and of course he was an icon of the uh, uh, 1960s as well. So uh, the goal of the uh, presentations, as I mentioned, is uh, just to provide a different prism for viewing the 1960s. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of glamorization of the 60s and all the things that happened and all the big issues and so forth. And so I just thought, well, I'll find a, a unique way to talk about some of those issues. This is a quote from uh, John Kennedy. It said, uh, we would like to live as we once lived, but history will not per permit it. Meaning that we have memories uh, going back and uh, 60s generation are notorious for telling stories of how it was in the 60s and how great it was and Kennedy's point was well when you go back to write the history it's always not always uh, uh, the way we remember it uh, or want to remember it uh, anybody that's been at family gatherings and they start recollecting from 30 years ago uh, and there's three different versions in the room uh, you know why but uh, and it kind of ties into the idea of a golden age and the 1960s certainly was the, the golden age for uh, the baby boomers uh, and it, as you reflect back and it was a very unique dynamic uh, time period with all kinds of interesting unusual and sometimes tragic uh, events taking on place but the whole idea of a golden age goes back to the ancient Greeks and Chinese and other almost every tribe uh, and civilization has their golden age that uh, you talk about that where we remember things probably that kind of as the perfect time even though it wasn't necessarily that way but uh, the uh, Robbie sent uh, some photos on the uh, the golden age for the uh, uh, San Francisco uh, area and the beat generation and so forth uh, and so it's a way to remember and and look at kind of special times. Uh, we talk about myths, and that's what I'm going to address mostly. I'm not sure if I can tell you what the reality was, but I can tell you the myths of it. Uh, and a myth is uh, pretty simple, but somewhat complex. So it's a, <coughs> a legendary story 
with some elements of truth and fiction. And the purpose is to explain events and beliefs of the past. Uh, and again, uh, whether you look at the, the Norse uh, sagas or uh, tales from different uh, tribes in Africa, Asia, they all have their, their myths and they all contain truth as well as uh, uh, fiction uh, as you, you go through this. So it's uh, important to, so when someone often says, well, that's just a myth. Well, a myth is not necessarily totally untrue. There's truth and there's uh, maybe imagination. So, first myth, John Kennedy and Richard Nixon uh, we all think that John Kennedy was the liberal and Richard Nixon was the conservative. Now, before I address that, I want to talk about these two guys because I think they're much more interesting as a pair than they are separately, even though they have obviously very unique stories and so forth. But um, and the, the, it's very rare that two people who are presidents interact as much as these two did. The, the other two that come to the mind is Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And John Adams and Thomas Jefferson started out as political enemies. Uh, after they were president, they became friends and had a rich correspondence. Ironically, they uh, uh, died on the same day, July 4th, 19, or 1826, probably within hours. Uh, or less uh, of each other. Nixon and Kennedy um, started out differently. They um, started out as friends. They came into Congress. They were both Navy uh, war veterans. They had uh, uh, a lot of ambition and they talked a lot. Now they weren't social friends because Nixon was not in the social strata that Kennedy was, but. Uh, they had a lot of discussions, and they both knew that they were going to be president. That was just at age 30, they, were, they knew they were going to be president. That was just their hubris, that was their drive, and they became presidents. Now, Adams and Jefferson were kind of heroic uh, uh, figures. Uh, uh, both Kennedy and Nixon were tragic figures. The, uh, the fact that uh, their presidencies both uh, ended tragically in much different ways. But I think it's a really, and they certainly dominated the 1960s uh, politically. So let's talk about the political uh, philosophy and take a look at it. The, uh, first, the case for Richard Nixon being a liberal. Uh, and this is in terms of policy uh, and the uh, governmental programs that he was involved with. On foreign policy, Nixon was a moderate. Uh, he uh, uh, supported uh, detente when he was uh, president. Uh, and detente, of course, was the, uh, the idea that we need to dialogue with the Soviet Union, try to find some mutual uh, ways to work together and so forth. He was opposed to the uh, uh, missile gap going to the 1960 election, which uh, we'll talk about with Kennedy, said that, well, we've got to speed up our armaments. We've got to build more nuclear weapons because the Russians are getting ahead of us. Nixon also opened up uh, relations with Red China, uh, which was maybe his crown, crowning achievement. Uh, given the events of today, it would be worth a whole session just to talk about or uh, that, that event and its impact. So um, Nixon as president, he also supported affirmative action, created the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, was in favor of wage and price controls. Can you imagine a Republican president or even a Democratic <laughs> pro proposing that today, but you know, that came out of their World War II uh, type of experience supported uh, increase in the minimum wage, and uh, he proposed the guaranteed income, which did not happen uh, during his term. Uh, a uh, governor in California stole the idea from him in 72, and uh, Ronald Reagan started the first uh, one of a term, they 
they didn't use this term, but they used earned income credit. So if you're poor enough, uh, you get money back rather than paying taxes. Uh, Noam Chomsky, a good friend of uh, everyone here, uh, was a left-wing MIT uh, uh, professor, and he called Nixon the last liberal uh, president in 1998 because if you remember in the 90s, a lot Clinton and others were kind of moving to the center, uh, but he liked the, the policies of uh, uh, Nixon. The other interesting thing about Nixon is the personality and background. Just the opposite of Kennedy. So, you know, he's from California, Whitaker, California. Uh, his dad was not a very successful small business person. Um, and so he had to work for everything. Uh, and he studied hard. He, became, he was a scholarship student through college as well as uh, law school. Uh, top of his class, first or second at uh, Duke uh, University Law School. Um, thought he was go right to Wall Street or some New York City law firm, uh, and nobody would take him. So he went back to Whitaker, California. But he had a chip on his shoulder. He always felt, you know, like he was as good or better of some of the uh, uh, other high performers, but he didn't have the social class standing. Uh, uh, he was raised a Quaker. His mother was a good Irish Quaker. Um, your religion that you grew up with doesn't determine what you're going to do, but it has an influence. And I think it had uh, uh, influence on uh, Nixon. Uh, he was a practical leader, problem solver type, um, uh, but he had very little personal charisma. You know, he wasn't uh, uh, an exciting guy to be. It wasn't Bill Clinton, you know, and, uh, <laughs> uh, good or bad. So, so that's the case for uh, uh, Nixon as a, uh, a liberal. So the case for Kennedy as a conservative uh, on foreign policy, he was the uh, uh, he was a hawk, as we used to we don't use those hawk and dove terms anymore. But um, so. Uh, He's the one that uh, got the United States involved in the Vietnam War on a major scale. I mean, we had some advisors running around, but uh, Kennedy decided we got to go in and uh, really do it upright. Uh, he talked about the missile gap with the Soviet Union. We had to increase spending uh, and uh, also almost came to nuclear war over, over Cuba uh, at that time. So. Uh, he was a strong anti-communist, Kennedy was, as Nixon was, as usual where Humphrey was. Uh, so uh, that was a, a pretty standard uh, position of, for both Republicans and Democrats at that time. Um, Kennedy, one of the probably most substantial accomplishments, was the advocated for corporate and individual income tax uh, to stimulate the economy. Uh, Sounds rather Republican to me, but the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the tax rates were fairly high at that time too, but the, the, these were enacted after, he, after his death um, and probably propelled the, the economy of the 60s to be as robust as it was to, uh, uh, to do this. Um, uh, Kennedy, of course, he was from a privileged 1% background tied to the Ivy League uh, power elite, and uh, the, uh, he felt very comfortable, even though he was only a second generation into the, the, the power, but he had the, the money to kind of open the doors and so forth, and the, uh, keep in mind the Ivy League, or the Yankee New Englanders as we talk, um, were one of the dominant political forces in the country uh, from the revolution to the Civil War they were neck and tuck with the uh, aristocracy of the South. After the Civil War, they dominated uh, the, uh, the country politically and culturally, uh, so forth. So it's a very uh, high-end uh, position. It's raised a Roman Catholic, and again, that doesn't religion doesn't project how you're going to be. But and Catholics have some extremely liberal social justice people and have some very conservative 
almost monarchist uh, <coughs> folks and so forth. Uh, Griff can give us more details on that later, but <laughs> so. Uh, uh, and Kennedy was an inspirational leader. He was just charismatic. Um, and, but in terms of what he actually accomplished is really up, uh, uh, up in the air and still debatable uh, to this day. I saw him speak in my hometown in 1963 on the courthouse steps. And I was like 12, 13 years old. And, it's so exciting to be there with all those crowds. And the college students were there protesting because, you know, college students were Republicans, right? 19, <laughs> 1963, especially from a pr small private school. Uh, but um, I, I was lucky enough to find on YouTube a radio or a copy of uh, a tape recording of his speech. And not the video, but the, the audio. And you can see why he was so charismatic. I mean, he just had that uh, ability to uh, work the stump and work, you know, through the, the crowd and so forth. So, so that's the arguments uh, uh, between Kennedy and Nixon for liberal and conservative. Here's a really interesting uh, map of the ele election of 1960, and the <coughs> is. If you, the first thing you think of is California was a Republican state. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, but yeah, you look yeah. this. The, Texas so the, being a Democratic state, well, <laughs> and yeah. Texas was blue. Pardon? And Texas was blue. Yes, yeah. and, yes. Uh, so, and we talked. One of the myths that come out of the came out of the uh, 1960 election is that it was a very close election. Kennedy barely won it, and if it wasn't for Mayor Daley and Lyndon Johnson uh, adding a few votes here, he wouldn't have. But we all know that the, uh, uh, <coughs> the votes, individual votes, don't matter. What matters are the electoral votes. And you can see it's a pretty significant victory uh, for Kennedy and, and Johnson. The key was the Deep South. And in 1960, uh, African Americans were disenfranchised throughout much of the, the South. Uh, the, uh, and <clears throat> if they were franchised, they'd vote Republicans. Because Martin Luther King Jr. and Sr. Uh, were Republicans. And Anybody know the reason why? Well, they came from the Abe Lincoln. Right. Yeah, the Republicans, you know, uh, uh, with Lincoln freed the slaves, were opposed to uh, segregation, so forth and so on. So, uh, so it's interesting that um, Kennedy and Johnson won by carrying the segregated South. Mm. The. Uh, and so, and of course, I think both Johnson and Kennedy were supportive of civil rights legislation and those types of things. Although there was a really interesting article in Politico here a week ago. Jackie Robertson, uh, the famous baseball player, in 1960, there was a lot of pressure for him to endorse either Kennedy or Johnson, or Kennedy or Nixon. And so he's, uh, and he sat down with each of them separately uh, and talked to them one on one. And he endorsed Nixon for president in 1960. And he was under a lot, of, he took a lot of heat for it. And said, well, why did you uh, pick Nixon over Kennedy? And he said, well, when I sat down with Nixon, uh, he looked me in the eye, he wanted to talk about policies and issues. He listened rather than talked. Uh, so forth and so on, and I just felt comfortable personally with him. When I sat down with Kennedy, he didn't look at me. He kind of looked away and he talked and so forth. And so it was just a personal thing that uh, it was interesting that uh, uh, personal dynamic that's 
you know, 1960 was different than 1970, but it was uh, kind of an interesting story. So, uh, so I think a case can be made that Kennedy was a conservative, Lincoln was, or Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> You got me going, Craig. Uh, uh, Nixon was a liberal, and there were exceptions. So this is not a, you know, certainly on labor issues, Kennedy was very liberal. That was a big part of the, the blue collar workers were a big part of uh, uh, the Democratic Party at that time. And uh, so, but it's, again, just a different way of looking at it, especially when you look at the policy end of it. Another myth uh, was the, the free speech movement began at, University of California, Berkeley, in 1964, and notice I didn't capitalize free speech movement, mainly because in talking about the bigger idea of freedom of speech. So the uh, the, the event at, at Berkeley was the free speech movement with capital letters, and it was a defined special group. <clears throat> but the sense being people in the 60s, we tend to think every, you know, <clears throat> all history started in, in 1960 or 61. And, but, <laughs> so, but actually free speech uh, as a uh, general uh, movement has a much different history, a longer history. So here's a couple of highlights. In fact, it goes back to 399 with Socrates who first articulated, at least in the Western world, uh, the idea of free, free speech. Um, the Magna Carta in England uh, kind of promoted the idea of rule of law, you know, controlling the king's uh, authority, so forth. These are all conceptual, although a lot of things in the Magna Carta were written into uh, uh, British law. Galileo, of course, uh, was that scientific rebel that uh, challenged the establishment and the strange idea that the uh, uh, earth revolved around the sun and not the sun revolving around the earth. But, and the scientists and uh, Pope at the time uh, said, well, you're obviously wrong. So you're under house arrest for the rest of your life. But, but the fact that he uh, made that type of challenge was uh, a big moment in uh, people being willing to speak out. The Declaration of Rights of Man came up with the, uh, through the French Revolution, and then of course the U.S. Constitution, uh, First Amendment established the, the idea of freedom of speech in the United States. And there's probably a thousand books written on freedom of speech and the intricacies of it. So this is, this is quite a quick survey, but I think it gives you an idea of that, that evolution. Um, and Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, is the one Supreme Court justice that people have mentioned the most on the topic, but there's plenty of other justices who have commented on it. Well, the importance of Holmes, I think, was that he set the parameters. So in 1919, basically he said the uh, freedom of speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. So he sent the one parameter, you know, you, there are limits to freedom of speech, you know, and the court has to figure that out. That's their job, is, and it goes back and forth. On the other hand, 10 years later, he articulated another principle on the other limits, uh, and basically uh, said that freedom of thought, not the thought for those we agree with, or but freedom for the thought we hate. So it's just not so that we can say whatever we want whenever we want. It's that the person that you really find disgusting and their political views, uh, they get the right to speak too. And um, that's a kind of an interesting concept. But he, he kind of articulated the boundaries and everybody's been arguing uh, over the years, what fits in between those boundaries. So just a quick summary. Um, two reasons I say that Berkeley was not, uh, or is part of a, a myth, is that the issue of freedom of speech in Western civilization has been 
debated, discussed uh, for uh, 2,500 years. And it keeps getting refined, changed, and so forth. It's not uh, something that's written in concrete that you're, you know, can't interpret. It's obviously open to interpretation. Plus, the Berkeley free speech movement in capitals uh, was more of a political movement uh, for uh, different groups who wanted more power in the uh, college uh, campus. They didn't really want freedom of speech for everybody, but they wanted it for them, you know, their their groups uh, and so forth. So. So another myth of the 60s, when well, it was a, a, a time of, of peace and love, and uh, uh, yeah, I, didn't, I was hoping people would be wearing their tie-dyed shirts and <laughs> have a flowers in your hair and all that tonight, but uh, uh, obviously that's a, a big part of it, uh, that image of the 60s, the uh, uh, Robin and I were talking about, Hate Ashbury in the Summer of Love, and what that was like. Well, the Summer of La Love lasted 30 days uh, before the drug dealers and sex predators moved in, and uh, it changed things uh, quite radically. But it was really a media uh, uh, creation. And Robbie has a great photo of uh, was it ABC News or local? Yeah news station that uh, would come in to do uh, shots for Haight-Ashbury, but if there was nothing going on, they went back to the truck and would get some flowers and pots and mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. that's, awesome. that's, what, that's probably all costumes. Like, oh, yeah. 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 Right. So, uh, so again, it's an image of me. But a lot of people, uh, I think, were fascinated by that idea of peace and love. So it wasn't mm -hmm. totally wrong. It just, uh, some of it was manufactured and uh, some of it involved uh, some things that were not uh, uh, copacetic. Uh, so in the 60s, there was a large amount of political and racial violence. Uh, the, uh, in the early part of the, in the 1950s and 60s, so you had uh, the KKK and individuals engaged in, in violence against civil rights activists, like I say, especially in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you also had violence uh, against peaceful civil rights, anti-war demonstrators by police and others in different parts of the country uh, for different reasons, but it was there. Uh, also, there were uh, hundreds of riots uh, by African Americans in uh, major American cities. Uh, and as the decade in cre er, moved forward, there were more and more uh, riots, uh, at, and especially in the late 60s, early 70s, and so forth. Uh, there was also domestic terrorist group running around. That some of these names you might remember, the Weather Underground uh, uh, from SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. Uh, the New World Liberation Front, uh, other groups, the, uh, and there were real bombings. Uh, I was in Mankato student teaching in 1972, and uh, the students, which I might have been part of, uh, closed Highway 169, blockaded it uh, over uh, one of Nixon's actions. Um, and, you know, 90, 5% of the people were great, peaceful, did everything the right way. Uh, but uh, somebody blew up the new law enforcement center at Mankato that was being built. Cost about a million dollars in that time period, probably about 10 million today. Uh, um, also, there was a bombing in uh, Minneapolis, I think at the federal courts building. Uh, of course, the famous University of Wisconsin bombing and on and on, so forth. So. Uh, so that was uh, uh, not uncommon. Uh, you also had assassinations of John Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, George Wallace, all they survived. Um, so there, there was the violence, but there were also some negative legacies as well. Uh, drug use and abuse. Um, 
So it's the uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, and uh, this is the drug part uh, was there. The other thing is violent crime uh, really took off uh, from the 60s. There's an interesting chart <coughs> on uh, cocaine and heroin uh, visits to, uh, to the emergency rooms. And the, uh, I mean, you can see that especially cocaine, by the 80s, it's really taken off. Heroin's, the purple is certainly uh, increasing as well. Uh, and this is important. We talked a little further about what happened in uh, the early 90s as a result of that. I just, <coughs> so just a, <laughs> Raise your hand if you know what the 27 Club is. You know what the 27 is. Wow. Oh, <laughs> one person, you get the gold star. <laughs> you want to tell us what the 27 Club is? Well, it's those uh, mostly music performers who died at the age of 27 from drug. From? Uh, from drug. Yeah. 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 Mama Cass wasn't yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so, and, so Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, uh, Jim Morrison, um, there's a fourth famous one, uh, but and there's many. The 27 Club, uh, mainly the, the, the idea came up with rock musicians, basically, but it also has been applied to entertainment uh, actors and others, that around the age of 27, uh, a lot of folks die from uh, drug and, and like even as late as uh, Amy Winehouse uh, alcohol issues and it um, I think it's symbolic and that's where the Jimi Hendrix uh, comes in that <coughs> that the rise of drugs now drugs have always been very uh, prevalent in music theatrical communities going back to the of the 30s and so forth, but the fact that so many musicians were dying at this range, and it's not necessarily 27, but it could be uh, sooner or, or later, different things. Um, it's a, an interesting uh, phenomenon. Some people say, well, statistically, it's this and that, but I think, you know, you give young people a lot of money, a lot of fame, and it, it, it stresses some people out. You know, John McCarthy, McCartney and, uh, or John Lennon and Paul McCartney were both heroin addicts uh, at one time. Uh, others, uh, we've talked about uh, uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards are apparently genetic wonders that they're, <laughs> they're still performing today after the amount of drugs they took. <laughs> so apparently, uh, uh, Good luck uh, does uh, help in, in surviving uh, drug abuse uh, so forth. So just they, they balance it out with their sex lives. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask you for any more details. But <laughs> and I just found this. Uh, this is kind of interesting. I don't know how many people have heard this term before. Deaths of despair. Oh, wow. I had not heard that before, and it's fairly recent. In the last ten years. Uh, uh, researcher had uh, has come up with this, but basically combines uh, statistical data on suicide, alcohol abuse, and drug uh, abuse and deaths related thereof. And it's a kind of an interesting, again, a different way of looking at um, th these problems. Um, and so, starting back in 1900, there's something crazy going on here, but um, just follow the lines a little bit. So here's the green at the bottom is the, the drugs. Uh, and you can see how that takes off, especially here in 1980, but it certainly starts. For some reason, it was pretty quiet there between uh, uh, 1930 and uh, 1960. But, um, so, and then the, the alcohol, the same thing. Now, for those that uh, wonder why the United States was crazy enough to uh, get into prohibition, this line tells you. So in 1900, the death rate from alcoholism was pretty significant. 
and it drops off with the prohibition in 1918 or 19. Um, and, uh, you know, we can spend a lot of time asking about that, but the, uh, and it's interesting, suicide pretty much stays in this same corridor throughout time for whatever uh, reasons. But when you put the three of them together, this is the deaths of despair line, again, prior to 1920. Uh, um, the, uh, but you start in 1960, and there's the, so the impact, uh, you know, and again, uh, there's lots of books written about uh, uh, these issues, but I think it's an indicator at least. Uh, Tim, are you saying your deaths of despair is the total suicide, alcohol, and drugs? Or that's what how I saying? understand it, yes. Okay. Uh, why, was it, why was it so high in the early 1900s? Was there a depression back No, I, I can only guess. Uh, it was uh, the height of the industrialization, uh, mass immigration to the United States. Um, and keep in mind, uh, there was no real medicine uh, that existed then. I, mean, you, you, I don't think even you didn't even have aspirin. So oftentimes, if you had to have a pain uh, reliever, it was uh, uh, alcohol, or a lot of the pain remedies contained uh, opiates, uh, and well, cocaine, Coca-Cola. Uh, there's so it was a the life expectancy about 45. Yeah, that's 40 maybe, depending on where you were and your income levels and so forth. The fact that they gave that stuff in those early days to their children. Mm -hmm. Probably. Well, I mean, you, you wouldn't know. I mean, yeah. it's not like you're poisoning them on purpose. This no, is no, what no. you go to find at a store to help pain right. or some other ailment. Uh, Helps me. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I. I haven't had the time to uh, spend research time on, but it's uh, yeah, it's a fascinating thing. But I think it's pretty much the industrial revolution had not quite hit the pharmaceutical and medical field yet. Um, the biggest change for this era in terms of health was city water and sewer systems, sanitation it had a huge uh, uh, impact on. Uh, public health, yeah. but uh, it was the still. Despair have increased uh, during COVID because it only brings us up to before. 2020. Well, I like to live in the past, so I've been trying not to. <laughs> it, uh, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it, I'm tempted to go well, on all these issues to go to the, today, but we don't have time to get into that. Uh, uh, Tonya. Uh, but crime uh, took a big uh, uh, jump uh, after 1960, uh, peaks out in the early 90s. Um, again, this is one I avoided uh, seeing what it is uh, today, but the thing I wanted to point out uh, from this chart and the chart, the first chart on uh, drug uh, issues was in the, uh, in 92 when the, uh, Clinton was elected uh, president. Uh, he and the Congressional Black Caucus and uh, worked with Republicans to pass the Clinton crime bill, which included uh, a much higher rates of incarceration uh, throughout the United States. And uh, that and other factors had a big impact on, the, on, on crime. Now, Around 20, uh, this era here, there was a political backlash against that, uh, which is a whole different story. But the point of this whole thing is that the, uh, the crime went up dramatically from, from the 1960s. So the themes of love and peace were part of the 60s. They're an important part for all, not all of us, but most of us, I think. 
that idealism uh, was very important, but there were a lot of uh, uh, negative behaviors that were happening in the 60s and continued on a after that. So another myth and one that uh, gets talked about constantly is the, you know, the fear of communism that uh, the Red Scare and the uh, issues that it was just blown out of proportion. Uh, it did help that there, there was a drunk sen senator from Wisconsin that <laughs> became kind of the spokesperson, but uh, uh, it, it certainly was there, that fear, and the question is, well, was it justified, or what, why, what caused it? Uh, so, um, let's look. The, in 1920, uh, there was one communist country, the Soviet Union, Russia. Uh, 1970, there were 26 communist countries with about 35% of the world's population. So. Over a 50-year period, that's not a bad growth uh, if you're uh, looking at market share and so forth for political purposes. Um, and uh, the two largest uh, countries in, uh, had uh, uh, nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union and, and China. Uh, so there's some fear on that front. The uh, other characteristics was, of course, that communism is a totalitarian uh, system, uh, there's uh, you know, no freedom of speech, religion, political activity really allowed. Now Stalin ran for election in the Soviet Union and uh, he'd always win by 99% to 1 and the 1% we've never heard from again. But <laughs> the, uh, uh, um, and it's a you know, state-run economy with uh, permanent leadership. Uh, I don't know how long Putin's been, well, he's, Russia's not technically a communist country anymore, but going back to Stalin and uh, others, uh, it doesn't change very fast. Plus, a lot of mass murder uh, in uh, every communist country that's been founded, I guess. The, uh, and large segments of the uh, uh, population in communist countries tend to want to leave. Uh, they vote with their feet, basically. Uh, we saw that in Vietnam after the, the war, uh, and so forth. So, uh, internal issues related to communism, uh, the labor unions, this was a battle between, uh, it, internally within the labor movement, uh, and also in terms of various strikes. One of the most interesting ones uh, is the 1940, or 34, Minneapolis trucker strike. This was a big deal. Uh, shut Minneapolis down. Uh, basically, it was led by the Dunn brothers, who were Trotskyites. I won't ask how many of you know what a Trotskyite is, but <laughs> Leon Trotsky was uh, uh, Lenin's, one of Lenin's right-hand uh, men, but he, he lost out to Stalin and got a bad headache from it. But anyhow, uh, the. Uh, so this was a big deal, and it was led by uh, that group. But there were a lot of, within the union movement and the labor movement, there was a big battle to speak internally as well as externally uh, on the, the issue of uh, communist groups. Political groups, again, a good Minnesota example, uh, was the internal conflict in the DFL. If you remember uh, 1946, uh, well, the 1930s and 40s, uh, the DFL were separate parties. The Farmer Labor Party was separate, elected two governors in Minnesota. Uh, the Democratic part, Party was separate. So this young whippersnapper, Hubert Humphrey, comes along and says, uh, you know, we've got to get these two parties together. We're never going to uh, have any uh, uh, real success in the elections unless we do that. So he did. and. Uh, uh, got it together in 46. Well, the first thing that happened is the uh, more radical left-wingers in the Farmer Labor Party kicked Humphrey and his friends out, like Gene McCarthy and Don Fraser and a whole litany of uh, uh, Eugene uh, Anderson and so forth. And uh, Humphrey came back in 48 and purged the left-wing out of the DFL party which 
he figured, well, there's no way the DFL would ever win elections if they were controlled or highly influenced by uh, uh, forces. But it was a big, big political thing. Of course, the espionage, the Rosenbergs, Al <coughs> Alger Hiss, and other cases uh, uh, were big uh, items at the time. Uh, and of course, President Kennedy was assassinated by an American communist. Uh, there are theories otherwise, but <laughs> right now that's the uh, uh, only one that there's evidence of. Unless you're watching, uh, what's the producer uh, Stone's movies? Or? So anyhow, uh, communism was a legitimate threat, uh, and the question is how do you respond to it? What's the right way to do it? Some of it was obviously over the top and uh, so forth, but it uh, uh, was uh, was there. So the civil rights era, uh, when we talk about civil rights era, we think everything is all the same time period and everybody flows together and everybody was uh, together. But there was actually two eras that historians identify uh, in the, the, the time period. And I picked this uh, photograph for a couple of reasons. You might identify some of these people. This is uh, Dr. Spock, not the guy from Star Trek. Uh, but the guy who wrote the, he wrote the book that uh, allowed us to become spoiled brats uh, about parenting and so forth. At least that's what the greatest generation said. Uh, this is uh, Rayford Johnson, if you remember. He's the fellow that uh, is a pro football player. Uh, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in L.A., he's the one you saw in the photograph holding his head uh, after the uh, uh, shot. So, um, and. Oops. And this guy, uh, that's uh, Monsignor uh, Charles Owen Rice. Uh, he was a civil rights and a labor priest. If you've seen the movie The Waterfront, uh, this is kind of the Carl Model, Mullen uh, uh, figure. Uh, he was my uh, parish priest uh, in high school in Washington, Pennsylvania, and uh, very. Uh, uh, dynamic force in the Pittsburgh area for saying, labor and uh, civil rights and into his 80s he was writing a column for the Pittsburgh uh, Catholic newspaper and so forth. So um, but I thought it was an interesting combination of people. So the civil rights era really is uh, 1955 to 1965. Now anytime we uh, use dates, they're boundaries but they're not Absolute. So things did not stop on December 31st and something new began January 1. But you have to pick some boundaries. So just keep in mind that these are fluid. But that, that decade was really the civil rights era, which was uh, led by the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, were the main uh, organizations. The tactics that were used. Uh, was the American legal system and political system to end segregation and enfranchise African Americans. That was the approach. Go work through the system, uh, use the courts, use the political process. Uh, Martin Luther King obviously was the, the, the main leader. Uh, his concept was nonviolent resistance, uh, similar to what Gandhi uh, uh, preached in India and used very successfully. Uh, King was also inspired by uh, Jesus and Tolstoy, a number of other uh, people. But and King was not a pacifist. Uh, he believed in self-defense, but as a political process, he felt that nonviolent resistance, where um, you know that's where you have the sit-ins and uh, other activities. Uh, they're nonviolent, but you're resisting uh, just the same. Uh, it's a strong uh, Christian base within the African American churches. African Amer American churches played a huge role in the civil rights uh, movement, as well as some uh, of the white churches and uh, a significant uh, Jewish support as well. So it was a fairly ecumenical uh, approach. And it was highly successful. Uh, ended legal segregation, 
the court cases, Brown versus Board, <coughs> the Board of Education, the various uh, 1957 actually, which doesn't get a lot of attention, but uh, we started having these bills going through Congress to uh, uh, address those. Uh, the Black Power Movement, uh, pretty much 1966 to 75, again these are not firm dates, but help to frame it up. Uh, it was a fusion of black nationalism, Marxism, and, and street culture. Uh, the groups included the uh, Black Panthers, Black Muslims, Black Liberation Army, Sibonese, so forth, uh, uh, and more groups like that. Uh, the tactics were community organizing, community programs, and also uh, violent confrontations. Uh, with uh, uh, police and others. Uh, leaders included uh, Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Aldridge Cleaver, Cleaver, Angela Davis, and many others. So this is a more diffused uh, movement in terms of the organizations. Uh, each one of them had a slightly different philosophies and approaches uh, to things, and you have a very diverse leadership uh, of the uh, organizations as well. The uh, legacy is, is still being analyzed uh, with a lot of questions in terms of the effectiveness. Uh, probably the biggest positive thing about black power was cultural in terms of the idea of, uh, of pride. Uh, but the, in terms of actual um, policies or improvements in uh, black communities uh, is questionable, but certainly the black pride issue was a very positive uh, outcome. Uh, what historians are, are, the phrase they're using now is African American free, uh, freedom movement from 1955 to 1975 to avoid some of the confusion about what was civil rights versus black power and so forth both of which are part of that, but it gives its uh, uh, distinction between the, because they had different uh, methods as well as different goals. So, last myth, uh, um, one of the, especially the latter part of the 60s, early 70s, was that Vietnam War was just a fight for independence against American imperialism. That was the, the, the chant of the, of the day. Um, so, <clears throat> in 1955, North Vietnam and South Vietnam became independent countries within the sense that uh, they were tied to other powers. Um, and of course, the French were there before, but uh, so forth. But, uh, and the Soviet Union, China supported North Vietnam and the US supported South Vietnam with uh, other countries like Australia and so forth involved to a much smaller extent. Uh, the leaders of both countries were nationalists. I think it kind of gets lost that the, oftentimes it's represented that the uh, North Vietnamese were nationalists, but there weren't. South Vietnam kind of gets left out of the equation uh, uh, these days. But both parties, uh, the Diem brothers in South Vietnam were strong nationalists uh, as well. The, uh, <clears throat> interesting, in 1955, uh, over a million people left uh, North Vietnam when, the, when they were setting up the two new governments. And about uh, 100, oops, and about 100,000 left South Vietnam for, for North Vietnam. Uh, the uh, big portion of the uh, exodus from North Vietnam to South Vietnam uh, were Catholic and Buddhist communities that knew that uh, they would not be able to practice their faith there. Um, North Vietnam developed a communist system. South Vietnam, kind of an authoritarian democracy. Uh, and then with the failure to hold elections in 55, North Vietnam and the Viet Cong, which were South uh, Vietnamese communists, uh, began a civil war to uh, unite the country. 
Japan, the U.S. got involved in 62 in a large way. Um, some people say, well, it started under Eisenhower, but Eisenhower hated small wars. He did, after his experience in World War II and so forth, uh, he tried to stop the military uh, uh, from getting involved in a lot of uh, minor wars that seemed to escalate uh, out of control. Um, one of the big issues uh, was the assassination of the South Vietnamese president in 1963. So, this was the, the Diem brothers, uh, <clears throat> and basically he uh, was assassinated by the, the United States. Uh, this, uh, this was engineered, uh, uh, South Vietnamese military actually uh, pulled the trigger uh, on the, the, the brothers, uh, but it was Kennedy and the Lodge and the other groups involved that said we got to get them out of it, we don't like them. And the, Concern was that DMs were playing footsie with the, the Viet Cong and they were trying to uh, find some compromises and stuff that they weren't uh, they weren't as a, uh, <coughs> aggressive as the Kennedy administration thought they, they should be. Uh, ironically, they were, I think they were killed uh, uh, going to mass <laughs> of all things, uh, which kind of set Kennedy back a little bit. Um, so in summary, um, the Vietnam War was a, a, a civil war. Uh, it was for the unification of the country and decide who, uh, whose system of government was going to go there. Uh, and we took a side, the Russians and Chinese took a different side, and they won. So, uh, but the uh, oh. so the big question so what's the balanced legacy of the 60s uh, you say we talk about myths there's fiction and there's real life uh, events happening um, and that's the question that I have for all of you can I turn the lights on So, questions on any of the myths I covered, uh, or other thoughts, opinions? I know Griff has a question. <laughs> uh, how do you view the whole uh, draft movement problems through that era? Good, bad, and ugly. All right. Yeah, so you're talking about the military draft. Yeah. Um, the uh, well, it's really a a fascinating uh, study because we did things that were never done before. Um, first of all, the draft had a lot of exemptions for the upper class or middle class. So you had the college uh, uh, deferment, which I had, um, and that. Uh, for the first time, you see the upper classes not really getting deeply involved in the, uh, uh, the military. Uh, you know, you go to Shattuck or you go to some a lot of older schools. They have a list of fatalities of students who fought in the First World War and the Second World War and the Korean War. I don't think you find many in the Vietnam War, and that. Uh, that was probably the, the biggest thing is that uh, people could opt out so easily from, from the draft. The, uh, you know, it was, uh, and it was, you know, pretty much uh, uh, the, I wouldn't say lower classes, but working class people uh, who were involved, especially uh, white Southern men were the biggest single there's just discuss, discussion about, well, uh, uh, African Americans disproportionately, and um, that really wasn't the, the case. The, the issue came up when Johnson was president, so he just said African Americans are 13% of the population, don't 
put any more than 13% of the troops over there as African Americans. But, um, so, yeah, I, that's... Do you remember who was who pushed for the lottery to try and address that problem? Where did that, I don't remember where that came from. I, uh, I, it was affecting me at the time. Dead because uh, it was Nixon. Pressure, but he brought a guy from Peoria, Illinois named Kelly out of Caterpillar and I don't, I don't know his connection there, but he took him to Washington and Kelly drew up this plan and took him two or three years and obviously they went to the lottery first in 1970 because everything had happened from 65 through Kent State or whatever, but then after that then they decided that the all-volunteer army was the way to go and that's still an open question. <laughs> John, I want to recognize John because he's a uh, wounded uh, Vietnam veteran in service and country. I don't want to belabor the point, but you brought up the suicide thing there, and right. in case anybody hasn't noticed, there are people standing. We started at 11 o'clock this morning at the courthouse, and around that base of the Army, Air Force, Marines, whatever, they have significant pairs of military boots and those signify people that have committed suicide and they'll be on watch from 11 o'clock this morning until 11 o'clock tomorrow when their program starts. And so uh, those people, even though uh, the uh, suicide rate isn't well known, it is pretty disturbing, particularly among younger vets and and those kind of things. So uh, I didn't want to digress from tonight's program, but that no. suicide thing came up, and uh, I thought it was significant that mm -hmm. it's going on now. Sure, thank yeah, you for going. Twenty-three it. to zero. Kirk Say Mansfield. it again. Twenty-three to zero. Kirk Mansfield is doing that. And explain it a little more. Just George. like he said. The All the boots. Okay. Yeah. All right. And it averages 23 suicides among veterans per day. Oh. 22 and 1. Wow. It's mm. an active military. It's, that's, I think, mm. Mm. Oh. Another thing. But there are more suicides I, than that. I, another uh, thing that's interesting about your chart, too, about the despair, one of the bad things that came out of this current generation is the opioids. And uh, if you ever get a chance to read a book about the Sack Sackler family, and it started out with the, you know, the, the brothers, and they all had their different opinions, but they made so much money. But the, the existing people now have got their billions, and most of it's hidden away and there's been tremendous court fights against it, but opioids, uh, they had their own marketing team and their doctors they sent out there with a great PR message that, well, this is a great pain reliever, there's no problem, take it. Well, <laughs> we found out that uh, mm. there was more to it than BTI. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks for your inputs. Griff, you were gonna ask something else, or is that? Well, no, I, I just, I wondered, if, given the, the political orientation with Nixon and Kennedy in the 60s, whether the the legislation to create the lottery to address this um, imbalance between mm -hmm. who was going to Vietnam to serve, and suddenly all those college kids were glued to the TV to see what our number right, was going right. to be. Yep. But did that come from uh, the liberals or the conservatives, or where did that idea? Well, that actually came out of Nixon's. Right. It was the Nixon era now, whether, uh, I think everybody was searching for a more fair approach, but uh, you still had, uh, you could still have a college deferment, even with a, a low number. Uh, and, but once you lost your deferment, you know, what about COs? Well, that's been around since, I don't know if it's the beginning of the country, but uh, 
I, I think, uh, yeah, I think probably even back to the revolutionary days because there's... You talked about legacy and so on in the 60s. I would argue that the women's movement, it, the, or the, the machine of organization, of making change, the, all of that sort of thing, mm -hmm. absolutely, uh, Title IX, all of those things happening in the 70s was in part uh, learning from some of the lessons of the 60s. Mm -hmm. Of the 60s or so? Yes, yeah. 60s. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it culminated in the 70s, but right. I think that the, the organizational um, machine, as it were, and the, the idea of change and, and marches and all those kinds of things really, again, if, if mm -hmm. the question is what are the legacy of the 60s, I think a social movement through action, political action, um, all that kind of thing can be traced in part to the 60s. Well, and as you know, the women's movement is probably the oldest social movement going back to abolition pre-Civil War almost. Uh, uh, and the, uh, <coughs> yeah, so it, it, it's been around and they did pioneer, uh, well, to get the vote. Yes, sir. Uh, there probably was a need for a draft for the Vietnam War just because they had to have men. Right. And we weren't going to get volunteers, probably because the demonstrations of the 60s uh, had become a political discussion. Right. And uh, if, uh, if, it would have, if Vietnam would have happened earlier in the 60s, there probably still was enough patriotism we could have gotten volunteers. It was... Uh yeah, no, you bring up an excellent point because the, uh, uh, and I think the draft carried on from World War II in Korea. I think you still had to register for the draft, yeah. but it wasn't, you weren't, they weren't pulling in the, a large numbers of people. The, but there was a real demarcation. So, you know, you, you have Kennedy's intervention in 62, uh, LBJ with the uh, uh, Gulf of Tonkin, uh, uh, incident, uh, and I mean, most everybody supported it until about, well, it started with a lot of the uh, uh, New England colleges in about 65, 66, and 67, it really took off. Uh, my oldest brother was a Air Force helicopter pilot in Vietnam in 66, and, you know, there wasn't any big debate of, uh, about it, you know, it was just, I remember when I, uh, he was 10 years older, so we had a generational gap <laughs> that we often argue about at home, uh, but, it, you know, his thing, well, this is the only war we got, so that's what we got to do, uh, but by the uh, late 60s, things uh, changed dramatically. And it gets to Griff's comments about the draft, how that became a, a big issue on uh, college campuses, not so much in the uh, blue collar area. We talked to about the, uh, one of the big demarcations was the uh, hard hat riots. Did you anybody remember that concept? And I forget whether it was 68 or 69, but in New York City, you know, they're always building buildings, so there's all these construction guys working on buildings, and here comes a, uh, a big parade of the Ivy League students, and they're carrying uh, Viet Cong flags and, uh, you know, and Ho 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 Chi Minh and all these things, and these guys, some of them were Vietnam veterans, and some of them had their uh, kids in Vietnam, so a, a riot ensued uh, with the hard hit guys winning, but uh, but that was kind of that distinction that started between uh, more working class people and uh, the college educator upper uh, echelon uh, type of thing. It was, but it didn't happen overnight. It, there was a maturation period uh, uh, for that. Yeah. Some of the dark oh, behind you, John. I want to get, get everybody else. So everybody really had a chance. As I watched your presentation, <clears throat> having been very a high school student in the early 60s, whatever. What I, what I really recognize is the 
the myth production through the media. At that time, what the politicians wanted you to know, the media supported. There was no, like we have today, we have all these instruments of mm -hmm. mass communication and sat, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, back then, uh, just for example, um, uh, 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 Kennedy was a was a womanizer to uh, high heaven, but you oh, never really? heard, heard about that in the media. <laughs> Jackie Kennedy was a chain smoker, and it was the law. You would not show Jackie Kennedy with a cigarette in her mouth because the power, we wanted this queen that was perfect and whatever. Okay. Vietnam, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the uh, domino effect. Uh, if, we, if we're not over there, the commies are going to come to your doorstep. Mm -hmm. I mean, the media supported all of it. There was no... You know, no, no, nothing out there that, that, that stopped that. And now, now you do have the you know, muckrakers that are looking for every ounce of, of, of things that they can report on one way or another. But yet, I think we still want our myths because you still listen oh, yeah. to uh, people and the things you're hearing coming out of people's mouths about, you know, QAnon and all these other things that, that, that... Yeah, no, I think it's just human nature. We need to miss, to uh, put everything into, I think in college there's psych, social psychology class or something, we talked about your symbolic universe, and we need that universe to function it, however it's constructed. But I would also argue that uh, the media changed on a dime in 67 that they went from pretty much the role that they played during Korea and World War II of you know they were critical but they were not uh, uh, anti uh, and 67 uh, certainly with the Tet Offensive uh, that that changed with Walter Cronkite and so forth in one of my uh, 60s classes, uh, uh, a gentleman in, in Northfield who, he thought he had the cush job. Uh, he was in Army Intelligence and he was on an uh, Army uh, base. And it was a paperwork job and so forth. Um, well, the Tet Offensive happened. And he spent the next five days uh, with a rifle and a helmet and uh, uh, just huge crowds of uh, people, uh, Vietnamese, North Vietnamese coming in and so forth. And, um, but people considered the uh, uh, Tet Offensive a great loss for the United States. And he said, well, if Tet Offensive was a loss, then the Battle of the Bulge in World War II was a loss. Because we got knocked back on our feet during the Battle of the Bulge but came back and won. And basically the result of the Tet Offensive was that the uh, Viet Cong were wiped out. I mean, just, so the, uh, uh, but the American media said it was a defeat. How could we let this happen? And so the media played a big part uh, in, in uh, that, you know, one of the theoreticals, and it's always fun in history to say, well, what if this happened, or what if this changed? Uh, and I often wonder <coughs> if the American media had access to the uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong military, like they did to the American military, what would be the image, imagery that you saw? Uh, because there was no reporting on the uh, uh, activities of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, because they didn't allow it. Well, I, I had a student at Mankato State that was from India. Yep. And we were sitting talking with him after class one day, and we asked him, this would have been 65, 66. Yep. And we asked him about his view. And he said, in India, we get both sides. We have a newspaper that is supportive of the, of the communist movement, whatever we have right. the American paper. And you'll get some big battle, and this one will say, Boy, Americans won the, this big battle against the terrible uh, Vietnamese army, and you got this one that says there was a massacre of, of citizens and chimmen and children and whatever. I mean, they were diametrically the opposite to the extreme. Mm -hmm. 
both of them using the vehicle of the media to support yeah. what they wanted to support. There's a lot of facets that, again, I, I picked the things I picked, but uh, yeah, you can look at it from so many different uh, directions, and I think that's uh, that's part of the learning because they, you know, I think the rule amongst historians is that you don't really know what happened until 50 years later. <laughs> you know, after you can access documents and people's recollections and so forth, um, it, you know, it's just, uh, um, and I think the, uh, uh, I think it was Hiram Johnson uh, in World War I, 1918, said, well, the, the first casualty of war is the truth. And people, on both sides, I mean, that's, you're going to win, you're going to tell your story the way you want it told, and, uh, and so forth. Thank you so much. This is so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.